right, good evening, everybody. My name is Todd Scholl. I am the lead learner at the SCEA Center for Educator Wellness and Learning. Welcome. We hope you enjoyed that conversation with Lisa Ellis, who's a candidate for South Carolina Superintendent of Education. We are going to shift gears, and, and right now we're going to be learning about high-level self-care for managing high-level teaching. My guest tonight is an award-winning educator with more than 20 years of experience. Dr. Blades is a highly sought consultant and instructional leader who thrives on empowering and advocating for teachers. In addition to being a classroom teacher for 16 years, Dr. Blades has also developed and managed national STEM enrichment programs, written curricula and assessment assessments for some of the uh, education's top publishers, and has spoken at several national and international conferences. She has an inherent ability to spot gaps and develop creative solutions to fill them. This led to the creation of the powerful teaching strategies framework to help students build their critical thinking and problem solving skills based on both doctoral research and recurring themes in her own teaching practices. Since releasing powerful teaching strategies in 2018, Dr. Blades has shared the framework with thousands of educators across the U.S., giving them the tools and confidence they need to build more student-centered classrooms. Dr. Blades, welcome to our the SCEA's uh, live stream tonight. Thank you so much for having me. Listen, I need you to narrate my next trailer. I like the way you say powerful. Powerful, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like I like it. Um, I, I, we're so thankful that that you're giving up some time tonight to to talk to folks about self care and. Um, one thing I just wanted to, before you start, um, I think there's some people when you start to, when you tell teachers, you know, Hey, you know, you should take care of yourselves. There's a little, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's been a little bit of pushback on that from teachers saying, well, maybe if I had time, I didn't have to do this PD that I could do self-care or, um, so sometimes they think it's kind of placating. What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, how do you respond to educators who maybe feel that, um, maybe the idea of self-care is a little patronizing. Um, I can certainly understand that, but I do have this saying, um, you're either going to pay on the front end or you're going to pay on the back end, so to mm -hmm. speak. So you're going to take care of yourself up front or you're going to be forced to do so. And I say that from experience because um, I was diagnosed with a chronic illness in around 2009 or 10. And I did have that push through mentality and work through mentality. And I think back now, if I had just taken a medical leave when my symptoms first started to exacerbate, I think it could have saved my uh, traditional teaching career. But ultimately, at the start of my 17th year, I took a medical leave and never was able to return to the classroom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I'm, I'll tell you what, I'm going to turn it over to you and I'm ready to learn from you, Dr. Blaze. I'm so thrilled and excited to, to be learning from you tonight. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And thank you everyone uh, in the great state of South Carolina who's watching right now. I actually do have some roots in South Carolina. Uh, I have family there and I've done a lot of work with the um, alternative educators in South Carolina for the past few years. So it is an honor to be sharing with you tonight. I did prepare some slides because when it comes to talking about teacher self-care, I literally could do this um, indefinitely. So I wanted to make sure that I did stay on track tonight. Managing high level teaching, um, managing high level teaching with high level self care or high level self care from managing high level teaching, however you want to say it. Um, this is not going to be about getting a massage or lighting candles or any of those patronizing self care things, but really um, taking a look at our teaching practices along with those practices in our personal lives that can uh, enrich us as educators, have us showing up as our better selves and then eventually our best selves. And I'm speaking all of this from experience, y'all. 
I just shared that little tidbit about my chronic illness and how um, I really had to resign from teaching prematurely. So uh, you guys heard my bio. I'm not going to go through all of those statistics again. You can find them on my website, drmarquitablades.com. I want to start by asking you all if you are a this or a that. So I want you to just take a moment, look at the items listed in the this column and the items listed in the that column, and just kind of rate yourself. Are you a this, a teacher who sometimes misses deadlines, you have partially implemented lesson plans, maybe sometimes you procrastinate on critical tasks, like turning in your grades and or completing uh, some type of document that you have to turn in, or maybe you arrive to work late or dread going to work at all. Or perhaps you are a that, you're the teacher who's enthusiastic about your subject matter, you're creative and innovative with your instructional strategies, a leader in your building and district, you have great rapport with other faculty members and your students, and you're organized and manage your time well. But what I have found that most teachers are neither this nor that. And most of us are sometimes a combination of the two, or we could be a this one year and a that the next year. And there are certain factors that contribute to that. So maybe you're just an educator who loves the art of teaching, but you don't always like going to work because we know that teaching is one thing, but our job as a teacher is something entirely different. And it comes with a whole lot of responsibilities that sometimes don't adequately reflect our skill as um, an educator. So how did you get here? If you're that combination of this and that, how did you get here? Why are you in this place of kind of being in the middle or being a teacher who loves the art of teaching but doesn't always like going to work? It's probably gonna be a few of these factors, the constant mandates regarding your instruction. Yeah, I can remember one year we all went to this training. I'm not gonna say the name of the training um, because I don't wanna make it seem like I didn't like the training itself, I did. But I remember we went to that training and then um, we learned maybe 20 or 30 different strategies. And my building leader picked five strategies that every single teacher had to implement in their classrooms at least once a week. And I can remember thinking, wow, I could really see this being a high value strategy for ELA, but it's not really that high value for my science class. And I just didn't have the autonomy to make that decision for my students. So maybe it's those constant mandates regarding instruction or the constant changes to the curriculum. Um, I was up there in March of this year working with some teachers on the next generation science standards. So I know you all have some changes coming with your science standards and that's always a big deal um, in good ways and in bad because we know that that comes with a lot of turnover in terms of what we're teaching and how we're teaching. Sometimes you are getting criticism as opposed to feedback, substantive feedback for that matter. Maybe you have unsupportive administrators, disrespectful students and parents, apathetic students and parents. Maybe there's just a lack of regard for your efforts across the board. Uh, in my bio, Todd said I'm a, I'm a highly sought consultant, which um, rightfully so. I think I'm great at what I do, but it's really ironic because I consider myself the Susan Lucci of teaching. <laughs> I was nominated for teacher of the year every single year that I taught, and I never won. So I always felt like there was this lack of regard for the amount of effort I was putting into being a great teacher. Um, some of y'all are dealing with the unrealistic and unreasonable demands of your time. How do I have time to take care of myself when I have all of these demands I have to meet on the job? And don't get me started on the insufficient pay. 
And then finally, maybe the circumstances in your personal life are making it hard for you to show up as a great teacher. I know um, on the tail end of my career, that was the biggest issue in terms of me giving my students the best that I truly had to offer them. So I want to tell you all, when it comes to self-care, you have to think proactively rather than reactively. And that's why we're not going to talk about going to the spa. We're not going to talk about lighting candles. And we're not going to talk about uh, yoga and breathing exercises. Not that there's anything wrong with those, but I feel like a lot of times we implement those things as a reaction to being stressed out, being overwhelmed, uh, getting a course load that we're not 100% competent in, uh, we don't want to teach, or maybe having some students that we don't have the experience yet to manage uh, what it requires to manage them. And so reactively, we say, well, I'm going to do self-care this weekend. Self-care can't be the afterthought. It has to be proactive. It has to be how you design your life in such a way that it allows for your self-care to naturally happen. It's just a part of what you do. Self-care is not a reward, it's a right. So we like to reward ourselves uh, by treating ourselves well when something bad has happened. It needs to be the norm. It needs to be the expectation. The expectation that I'm going to spend X number of hours this week thinking about nothing but me or participating in something that is just for me. It's not a reward um, once something negative has happened. So to get us into this mindset, I want to take you back and have you think about your ideal school year. And uh, once this session is over, I'm going to share a link with you all so you can record a little special edition workbook that I put together just for this session. You can go to my website and download that. Of course, it's no cost. Um, but it's a reflection guide because I really want you to walk away from our time together tonight and think about how you're designing your life. What proactive steps are you taking to make sure that you're getting high level self-care so that you can do your best high level teaching? So step one is to think back to the school year, the best school year that you have ever had. And you're going to list the factors that contributed to your best school year. And I can clearly remember mine. I was teaching at Campbell High School in Smyrna, Georgia. I was the yearbook advisor. I had handpicked a very uh, energetic and atypical yearbook staff. So I had a combination of students who normally wouldn't be on the school's uh, yearbook staff, but they were coming in uh, with some great ideas. I was teaching my favorite course, uh, which is chemistry. And I was teaching all chemistry all day in addition to yearbook. So I just remember that year being a lot of fun. I remember the yearbook giving me access to students who I wouldn't normally have access to because everybody wants to be in the yearbook. Uh, everybody ha has to take a picture. So a lot of kids had to uh, seek me out. I had to seek them out and I got to know them and they weren't my own students. And those are usually some of the best relationships. Also, in addition to that, it was the year when my personal life was really together. Y'all, I was young. I was single, I was footloose, fancy free. So I would have fun on the weekends and I would take frequent trips. It was just the best year of my career. Now, once you have listed whatever those factors are, and it should be a combination of school related and personal, then I want you to prioritize that list one through whatever with one being the most significant factor. So what was the biggest factor that contributed 
to your ideal school year. And I'll say with mine, uh, the biggest factor was the school where I was teaching. Now that I've been away from that school for well over um, 10 years, I now know that that was uh, the best place for me. But in my quest to kind of get to that sweet spot of teaching, I left there, you know, looking for some other things. But the actual school itself was the reason. Next, I want y'all to think about your teacher end game. So I know that when it comes to teaching, we're supposed to be in it for the kids, right? We are in it for the kids. We love the kids. We love our subject. That pretty much goes without saying for most educators. So when I'm asking you about your end game tonight, I'm not talking about the outcomes that you want for your students. I'm talking about the outcomes that you want for you. It was never really my goal to become teacher of the year, but after being nominated so many times, I did expect to win at some point. Uh, that wasn't my end game, but for some teachers that is their end game. I remember having a teacher friend who literally said, I'm going to get teacher of the year next year. And she mapped out everything she wanted to do in our building to make sure that she won. And she did win. So she set the goal, she set her intentions and she won teacher of the year. But what is your end game? Um, after your teaching career is all over, what do you want to accomplish as an educator? And it's completely okay if it is uh, a professional accolade, if it is recognition, if it's, I know I'm the best physics teacher in the state and I want to be recognized for that. Or maybe it's at the end of my teaching career, I wanna write a best-selling book, or I want to start a consulting business, or um, I want to start my own community mentoring program, whatever that is. It's okay for your teaching career to be the foundation for something bigger that you want for yourself. And saying that out loud and recognizing that doesn't make you love the job or the kids any less. But there has to be something in it for you, what's in it for me, so that I'm willing to continue fighting this fight when it gets stressful and when it gets overwhelming. What is my why for me? I'm gonna take y'all over into the instructional side now before I get into the actual self-care elements that I am gonna ultimately share with you. I wanna take you into the instructional side because um, I'm not in the classroom anymore. It's not 100% by choice that I left, but it is by choice that I haven't gone back, right? So for those of you who don't have that luxury of saying, okay, I'm just not gonna teach anymore. That's not an option for me, Dr. Blades, to be doing what you do right now. We've gotta start with the instructional side because you know when you're in the classroom, you have to teach. So how do we structure our instruction so that it provides space for us to practice that high level self-care. And the first three things we need to consider when we're talking about student engagement and um, figuring out how we're going to structure um, our classroom, the first thing is skill and will. We have to think about what our students are capable of doing versus what they actually will do. And then next, we need to look at the rigor and relevance of the types of learning experiences we are attempting to engage them in. The more relevant the experience, the more rigorous the activity can be. And then finally, synchronous and asynchronous, not in terms of virtual versus in-person, but rather synchronous, what do we need to do collectively as a class versus what can my students do independently that will free up some of that direct instructional time. The, the main two that I like to spend time on are the skill and will and the rigor and relevance. 
So I'm going to talk about the skill and will first, and this points directly back to your self-care, and you'll see, you'll see how in just a moment. Uh, when we talk about skill, we're talking about a student's experience with a particular task, the background knowledge they're bringing into that task or that course, and then any natural talents that may help them be successful in your class. And when we talk about the will, we're talking about their confidence in their abilities, their attitudes towards the task, um, their general desire to get it done, and the what's in it for them. I just ask you teachers, what's in it for you as an educator, but students always want to know what's in it for me? Why am I doing this? So you'll see across the uh, bottom of the matrix here, we have low skill and low will low skill and high will, and then in the upper two quadrants, we have high skill with low will, high skill and high will. Obviously, we would want all of our students to be high skill and high will, but that's just not going to be where they are. But on any given day, depending on the subject, the teacher, the type of engagement strategies, a student can easily go from being high skill and high will to low skill and low will. So how do we adapt our teaching to accommodate for these varying levels of skill and will? I'll talk about adapting the teaching in a bit, but this is what it looks like for you based on where your students fall on this matrix. So if the majority of your students are in that low skill and low will quadrant, that means you're gonna be doing a lot of direct instruction. That means the heavy lift is on you. That means a lot of repetition, a lot of guided activities, a lot of reteaching and remediation, which leads to that sense of overwhelm and stress when we get behind on our pacing guide, when it doesn't look like our students are going to meet their benchmarks. All right, so obviously we don't want our students resting in this quadrant because that's where we're going to do the heavy lifting for them. In the low skill but high will, these are our students with the greatest amount of potential. The will is there, but the skill is not. So I always say if the will is there, if they're willing to do it, I can work with that and I can bring them up to speed with the skills. So we just have to identify their reasons for that. And then we have to help them develop some intrinsic motivation. We have to make sure they have some incentives. And then we have to make sure we're giving them constant progress checks. So it's a little bit better for us here. But if our students are in these upper two quadrants, obviously the high skill and high will is where we would prefer because we can just kind of delegate. We can give them more open-ended things, which would require less direct instruction from us. But our students who are high skill and low will, these are the can do's but won't do. I know Jimmy knows how to do this, but he just won't turn in his homework or the student who aces every quiz or test, but won't do any classwork. So they're not passing your class. That's a heavy lift for us as well. As the teacher, we have to find ways to structure our lessons so that we remove those obstacles that are keeping our students in that low will, what's gonna make them want to do it so that it matches their ability to do it. I'm gonna give y'all a little analogy here. So when we think about the level of instruction that we have to provide based on where our students are in that skill and will matrix, we know that oftentimes um, a large majority of our students may fall in those lower two quadrants, the low skill, low will, um, low skill, high will. So I wanna use the analogy of plant growth and ask you, what do all plants need to grow? And you're probably going to tell me uh, sunlight, water, and some type of nutrients, right? Those are the basics that plants need to grow. 
And what do we do when the plant is not growing? Do we go into response to intervention for our plants? And do we structure some type of tier one, tier two, and tier three remediation as a response to intervention? I've never really seen us do that. But with students, we do. When we do response to intervention, we usually develop some tier one, two, and three uh, responses. And those are usually at or below grade level for the students, right? But I'm going to challenge you to think, rather than remediate, we should accelerate. And that's kind of how we do with plants, right? If a plant is not growing, we don't take away the basics. We don't remediate the plant. We don't say this plant is not growing. So I'm gonna give it less water. Obviously it's not growing because it can't handle water. I'm gonna give it less water or I'm gonna give it less sunlight. But that's what we do with our students, right? They're not progressing. So we give them less, we remediate we should really accelerate uh, when the students are not progressing. I'm gonna talk about how we do that. We're doing that by raising the rigor. So that leads us into our second consideration. The first one was skill and will, the second is rigor and relevance. But before I jump over into uh, rigor and relevance, I just wanna point out that rigor and difficulty are not the same thing. So when we go back here and we look at our skill and will matrix and those students who are in the high skill and high will, it's not that we're giving them anything harder to do, not more difficult, it's just more rigorous. But if we gave every student an opportunity to experience a higher level of rigor through relevance, then we can accelerate rather than remediate. What does that look like? So I'm not gonna go completely into the rigor and relevance framework, but if you are not familiar with Dr. Bill Daggett and the International uh, Center for um, ICLE, the International Center for Leadership and Education, then I, I think you should definitely check out the rigor and relevance framework. Y'all, um, it has blooms in it. So if you're familiar with blooms, you're familiar with DOK, it's a variation of that, but I just prefer uh, the rigor and relevance framework version of it. And I showed y'all what it looks like on that skill and will matrix where the work lies for you. Well, the same with rigor and relevance. If we go across um, the lower quadrants here, we're going from low rigor and low relevance to the upper right where we have high rigor and high relevance. So it's the same format of this matrix. And this is what the work looks like for you. In quadrant A, low rigor and low relevance looks a lot like low skill and low will. The teacher is doing all the work. It's that direct instruction, okay? In quadrant B, the student is doing the work, but that's it. So it's usually repetitive type work. You've taught them a formula and now they're going to solve 50 problems using that same formula. Or you've given them a, a three paragraph essay. Do they still do that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you give them that and then they just keep plugging in. So it's that type of thing. But when you get into the upper two quadrants, you can see where it really shifts. In quadrant C, the student is doing the thinking. That's the high skill, low will, but they are doing some thinking, right? And we just wanna motivate them to get them to, to implement. And then in quadrant D, the student is both working and thinking. So you can see that rigor and relevance perfectly aligns with that skill and will matrix. And that's why they're so important when we talk about high level teaching. Okay, showed y'all that already. So how do we get to that level of rigor? I'm gonna share with you some broad strategies that we can use for teaching and to push our students into high skill, high will, and to those upper two quadrants of rigor. But I want to share this first because all of the strategies I'm gonna share after this are rooted in play-based uh, learning methods. 
So if we think about the fact that play allows children to create and explore a world they can master, conquering their fears while practicing adult roles, sometimes in conjunction with other children or adult caregivers. That's a lot coming out of play. But I'm willing to bet that a lot of us don't have a lot of play time in our classrooms. And the reason why we don't have it is for the same reasons why we're probably feeling like a combination of the this and the that teacher. It's all of those mandates, it's all of those rules, it's all of those changes, it's the outside factors, it's the apathy, it's the disrespect. All of those are reasons why we don't take a play-based approach to learning. But play will help children become self-efficient problem solvers because during play, children create and solve their own problems. When a child is asked to solve an academic or real life problem, they will be able to use the skills that they practice during play to find a solution. So essentially, play is getting into quadrants C and D of that rigor and relevance framework. If y'all think about these games that we used to play when we were kids, red light, green light, red rover, dodgeball, du double dutch, hide and seek, hot potato, Simon says, y'all, when I do this up north, I get strange looks, but y'all are in South Carolina, so I know y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm in Georgia, by the way. When I look at those games, they really point me back to my six core power skills of predicting, observing, writing, analyzing, researching, and reporting. Uh, they may not be this formal during play, but these skills are definitely emphasized. And the wonderful thing about it is, is that children do this without even thinking about it. They learn these games and they implement these very high level skills without being uh, supervised or without being walked through it or taught through it. So what happens when they come into our classrooms and they're not still exhibiting that high skill and high will or that high level of functioning when it comes to critical thinking? I've shared on this slide some of the science and engineering practices. Y'all know I'm a science teacher, so I had to pull these in but I like to share them with teachers across all content areas because I believe that these practices are gonna be high level skills for um, any subject that you teach. So asking questions and defining problems, developing and using models, planning and carrying out investigations. If kids are playing, they're planning and carrying out games, right? Just to see how it goes. Analyzing and interpreting data, after a good game of kickball, kids are gonna talk about who did what, what's gonna happen next time. We're gonna switch out teams. We're not gonna let so-and-so play second base. They do a lot of this and they do it naturally using math and computational thinking, constructing explanations, engaging in argument from evidence and obtaining and evaluating and communicating info. These are some high level skills, again, that kids can, um, gain just from naturally playing. But for some reason, we don't see that carry over into the classroom, which then leads us back to that low skill, low will, low rigor, low relevance, right? So I'm just going to remind y'all here, when it comes to self-care, you've got to think proactively versus reactively. How do I structure my classroom so that it has those play-based elements so that I te teach my kids at a high level, get that high level teaching, but it's also not more work on me. This is what classroom self-care looks like. It looks like implementing strategies such as problem and project-based learning because they are open-ended. You introduce the idea to the students, you put the work back on them. You put them up in quadrants C and D where they are doing the thinking and they are doing the working and you serve as a guide and you're delegating, okay? Those are the upper two quadrants of that skill and will matrix. You incorporate some play-based learning. So give your students some time just to explore with your content. 
I'm a huge fan of interactive student notebooks where the kids pretty much just do like 90% to 100% of all of their assignments in their interactive notebook. And then you collect it every two weeks, every four weeks. So you've only got uh, one major period of grading and you're not taking up individual assignments every single day that are uh, taking these round trip in your bag, you know, round trip from the school to your house, from your house to the school. And sometimes it never gets graded, right? Also flip classrooms. We were forced to flip our classrooms during the pandemic. So I would suggest that we keep a lot of those flipped elements. And then we can capitalize on using a lot of open-ended formative assessments. Let's get rid of some of those quizzes that we actually have to grade and let's go to some open-ended exercises where our students can verbally tell us what they know about a topic or they can free write about a topic and then we can easily spot those misconceptions and correct them in the next lesson or so. And then we also need to uh, use peer evaluations. So we're going to teach our students how to give each other substantive feedback so that they can perfect their work before they bring it to us. Uh, thereby, they're doing the thinking, they're doing the working, they are reflecting, and by the time they bring it to us, the amount of feedback that we have to give should be minimal. Now, all of these strategies take time to learn, they take time to train your students in, and they take time to implement, but you can start with one or two and work your way uh, through these. When it comes to the personal self-care, we have to establish some daily, weekly, monthly routines, and they have to be realistic, ones that we can actually stick to. So if you're not a big self-care person, if you're not used to, accustomed to putting yourself first, then this uh, routine needs to be super small. It needs to be something that's feasible, realistic, that you can actually do and form a habit of. Um, I'm gonna really say this, and I get a lot of pushback on it, but number two, stop socializing at work as much. Because the truth is a lot of the people that we sometimes socialize with, while we may like them and they, be, they might be nice people, they might be funny people, but a lot of times their energy can be draining. Um, we will get sometimes into these groups and then we'll try to one-up each other on how bad we have it or some things that our students have done. Oh, your kids did that, that's nothing. My kids did this. But if we minimize that socializing time and really focus on ourselves and our own students, that would cut down on a lot of the overwhelm that we're feeling. If you're already stressed out, it really doesn't help you to hear about five other people's stressors as well. Put yourself first. So when you are designing your lessons, it's okay to ask yourself, how many hours of grading am I going to have to do if I really want to use this activity? And is the benefit to the students worth the amount of time that it's going to cost me and them? Be proactive. So we have to think ahead about our self-care and we got to be honest, y'all. Be honest about where you're teaching, the classes you're teaching, um, the student population that you're working with. Are you really effective with the students that you're working with? Um, I left Campbell High School and I went to work at a all-girls charter school uh, one year. And I went because I just thought that it would be a better opportunity overall for my career as an educator. But when I got there, I realized that that wasn't my population. So I wasn't as effective with those students as I could have been or as I had been with the population of students that I worked with at Campbell High School. So sometimes we have to ask ourselves, am I working in the right school and right school environment? Um, do these students are these students able to connect with me in a way that they are going to be able to receive what I'm teaching them? And it really is okay 
if the answer is, uh, this is not where I'm going to be the most impactful. Impactful, And so you want to be proactive about changing that. If that means getting certified in a different area, if that means uh, starting to put out feelers so that you can go to a school that has um, the type of student population as well as uh, faculty population, that's going to be a better fit for the talents that you bring to the table, then start working on that plan so that you can put it into action. Personal self-care also looks like mandatory fitness or leisure activities. So my uh, favorite school year, my ideal school year, I remember I used to take dance classes three times a week. And my students would always say, are you coming to the basketball game? Are you coming to the soccer game? And I let them know, I'm going to promise y'all two games that I will come to per season. But the rest of the time, don't even ask me, y'all, because I have my dance classes and I'm not going to give that up. And that was part of that relationship piece. And it even just became like a running joke where my students would always say, well, we know she's not coming. We uh, need to pick the best two games that we think we're going to win because those are the only ones that she's going to come to. And uh, they still respected me for that because I was honest with them. So what's going to be your mandatory leisure? you've got to get into the habit of leaving work on time. And if you start to implement more of those student heavy uh, instructional strategies, it will allow you to leave on time. You're also going to set and honor boundaries. So the amount of extracurricular that you're willing to take on, being honest about what you can and can't do and saying no to those things. And then I would say uh, the most important two are nine and 10. Set some goals for the changes that you would like to make. I want to be able to uh, set and honor these boundaries. You may not be able to do that right away because maybe you have already committed to something or um, you're just not accustomed to it in your own mind. Like you just don't even have the mindset yet. So it's okay to not be there yet, but you definitely should have a plan and you should set some goals for by a certain time, you know, by three months into the school year or by uh, winter break for Christmas. I want to have moved over from this type of instructional strategy to that type. So give yourself time and then extend yourself some grace because going from 100% giver to now thinking selfishly takes a lot of mindset work and you're not going to get it right immediately. But I will say I was practicing so many of these when I had my ideal school year. I don't even think back then we were even calling it self-care I don't even think self-care was an issue back then, or if it was, I wasn't aware of it. Uh, but all of these are things that I had in place, and that's how I'm able to share with you now, because I've taken the time to look back and reflect, like, what were, were um, the circumstances in my life? What were the conditions during that time when I was doing my absolute best teaching, and I really enjoyed teaching the most? And it was because I was consistent with these types of practices, but now we call them self-care. Mm. Okay, so y'all, how are you gonna set those goals? I love the SMART framework. You're gonna be specific and make it measurable. So how will I know that I've set a boundary and I've honored my boundary? It's uh, when a student shows up at my doorstep at the last minute, wanting to retake a quiz and I tell them, oh, I'm so sorry, you're going to have to do that on another day. The moment you get to where you can say that and not feel bad about it, you'll know you've met that goal. Okay, and is it achievable? So do you have access to the resources? Uh, human capital may not be applicable, but do you have access to the resources to actually achieve this goal? So setting the bar so high that it just adds another stressor and another factor that's going to contribute to your overwhelm certainly is not going to help you. And then what's the relevant of it, relevance of it? Uh, why is this significant? 
This should be directly linked to your teacher end game. What is in it for you? And then finally, it should be time specific. So give yourself some deadlines of when you want to see changes in your classroom self-care as well as your personal self-care. And I would like to show y'all this quick little video um, on time management. Todd, can you give me a thumbs up if it's... Yes, you're good. Oh. Okay, so I just wanted to share that to leave you all with focus on the big things first. I think um, a huge source of our stress and overwhelm comes from the fact that we want to be perfect in all of the little things. But if we really focus our attention on the big things first, then we can move into that high level teaching with high level self care. So there's all of my contact information as well as the link to uh, grab that workbook that I mentioned to you guys. I'm sure uh, Todd can share that link wherever you guys will be able to refer back to this session. And um, if you have any questions about anything or you need any support around any of the topics that I mentioned, you can feel free to reach out to me. And thank you so much for allowing me to share, oh. Todd. Thank you, Dr. Blades. I really appreciate it. If you'll um, stop sharing, then we can just chat for a minute. I just want to say that was really a, a really interesting way to look at self-care. One that I hadn't really thought about is what kind of structures do we have in place with our students that are not only beneficial for them, but that are beneficial for us to help us stay sane, that help us take care of ourselves and be a little less stressed out. And I think that takes a lot of reflection and you gave some really good ideas on how we can reflect upon our practices, how we can become more efficient uh, and put some maybe some more ownership on the students as well. Um, but also those those personal self-care tips as well, I think, were really, really powerful. I think um, one uh, Carol Lee, who's done some sessions with us, said that it was the first person I heard say no is a complete sentence. And and I think one of the things that I I'm learning in life is is that boundaries are 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 really really important, but that there's boundaries that you can set as an individual, but as educators we also have to sometimes come together to set boundaries. So sometimes if you're in a school and you're the only one saying no, I'm not going to come to that bake thing on the weekend. I I'm not being paid for that, and no, I I want to spend time with my family. If you're the only one, maybe you feel like you're not the team player. You got to kind of get uh, called a whiner, or labeled, you know, like not you're not you're not cooperating. Um, I think we as educators have to start coming together and setting boundaries and saying, listen, you know, that type of type of thing is a, it needs to be optional, it needs to be voluntary. People who want to do it can, but if, there shouldn't be pressure uh, on people to do all these extra things. And I know in certain states, I don't know how it is in Georgia, here in South Carolina, but with being a right to work state, we have these clauses that say other duties as assigned. And it's and, exactly it, the same in Georgia. Yeah. yeah. And I was actually transferred from a school. That's that's how I got to Campbell High School. I was transferred from a school because I was labeled as not being a team player. Right. Because I did not want to uh, do certain activities on the weekends. So I, I do understand that pressure. And I do feel one of the biggest things that we do lack in education is that cohesive, that cohesiveness and working as a collective and really standing together and demanding the things that we want across the board in our profession. Right. 
And unfortunately, what we're seeing is educators, their response is, well, I'm just going to quit the profession and go do something else. And, and I'm not, I, I'm not, I have, I empathize with that completely. I'm not putting anybody down to decide that they need to, for their own sanity or for their own family to leave the profession. But what I would ask educators who are currently out there watching right now, um, instead of quitting, get together organize at your school level and push back on some things and say self-care as a collective uh, sort of endeavor that we're going to take care of ourselves, that we're not just going to be isolated and feel like, well, I've got to set this boundary, but I'm not sure if, if, if that's going to result in kind of some kind of backlash against me. Like right. let's get a group of people together to go to the principal and say, Here, here's what we we, we need this, or we need to set a boundary here There's because there's too much that's on our plates. And what I would say to folks who are watching, if you're not a member of the SCEA or your state organization, if you're watching in another uh, state, uh, uh, an affiliate of the NEA, I would just encourage you to look into joining that because that's the best way we can get together and organize and have structures in place to, to communicate and to help you um, do that in your school building. So I would encourage everybody in South Carolina to visit jointhescea.org. That's jointhescea.org. That link is in the comments along with a form. It says jot form. If you don't want to join tonight, but you'd like to just learn more, or connect with us, you can fill out that form as well. Um, Dr. Blaze, uh, I know you shared your, your links. Anything else you want to share in terms of uh, uh, contacting you if someone's interested in, in uh, working with you? Yeah, sure. Uh, I can be reached through my website, drmarquitablades.com, and I am powerful teaching across all social media platforms. I'm very active on social media, so people can always reach me that way as well. All right. Well, thank you. You've been wonderful, and I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to, to share with our members tonight and share with uh, our community and uh, wish you nothing but the best. And if there's anything we can do to support your work, please reach out. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. All right. Everybody else watching, thank you uh, for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed tonight's presentation. We will see you next week uh, on August 9th. Lisa Parisa, Parisi is going to be um, doing a session on the importance of teaching empathy. And then on um, the 11th, we are going to do a panel discussion where we're going to be exploring uh, artificial intelligence and virtual reality, um, the impacts on education. So that'll be next Thursday night from 7 to 8 p.m. Until then, you guys have a wonderful uh, week and a good start to the school year if you're heading back. And Dr. Blades, again, thank you so much. <laughs>